Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed the last sessions and the break. We are now about to start the keynote session, and this will be chaired by um, Xi Du and Alex Schläfer. And I hand over to Alex for the introduction. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, as Matthias already indicated, together with my co-chair, Chi, I uh, welcome you to today's keynote lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Bernd Christian Stahl. He is a professor at the Montfort University, and uh, he leads the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility. And uh, in that position, his research covers a broad range of philosophical issues, uh, arising essentially from the intersection of business, technology, and information, and the use of information. He's a fellow of the British Computer Society, also of the International Information Management Association, and also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And then he's an uh, active member of uh, numerous further associations. And uh, today um, he's probably referring to a book he's recently written. And uh, in that book, he's summarizing uh, the results and the experiences from a high profile research project, uh, a recent research project, Sherpa, uh, shaping the ethical dimensions of smart information systems. And uh, in that uh, regard, he uh, proposed the title, Artificial Intelligence for a Better Future. And I'm looking forward to learn more about how that will look like. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, let me start by uh, giving a quick overview, a quick introduction into my research group. Um, so once I manage to share my screen. Um, right. So I hope that you can see the screen now. I can't see anything else anymore. So I hope we can. OK, that's great. Uh, right, so we've just uh, mentioned already the, the title of the, the talk, um, and this comes from the Sherpa project, and I'll talk about those in a lot more detail in a minute. Uh, quickly, though, for those of you who are not familiar with us, um, I'm from uh, De Montfort University, which is a university in, the, uh, in Leicester. And Leicester, as you can see from the arrow here, is in the middle of England. It's in what we call the Midlands. Um, it's a, um, a, a new university by English standards that was created as a university in 1992. And my research group is one of the oldest ones we have. So we've started in 1996, and we have been looking for 25 years now at questions around ethical and social issues of AI, well, computing very broadly, um, uh, digital technologies, and at, at this point, AI uh, and related technologies are very uh, clearly high on the agenda. So we've been running the Ethicom uh, conference series that some of you may have come across if you are interested in the ethics of computing. Uh, we run a, bunch, a, bunch of, um, journal, a couple of journals and a bunch of projects. Right, so what I will talk about is the Sherpa project. And the Sherpa project is a European project uh, which started about three years ago, which is in its final uh, few months. Um, where we looked at the, the social, ethical, um, and human rights aspects of AI and big data, and we called this combination smart information systems. Uh, we organized the project around this uh, set of challenges, and um, the, the challenges then drove uh, our approach and drove our activities. So the first challenge we had, and remember this was written, the proposal for this was written in 2017, 2016, 2017, started in 2018. Um, one of the, the initial challenges was that we had the, the question of what are the ethical and human rights aspects of these technologies. And this debate, in particular the ethics of AI debate, of course, has taken off immensely since. Um, and it's, it's, it's also 50, 60 years old, um, but uh, four or five years ago, it wasn't quite as prominent as it is right now. So what we tried to do in order to address this question and deal with the challenges, we did a set of case studies. Uh, I'll come back to those in a second. We did uh, five scenarios. We looked at the technical side, in particular uh, cyber threats, and we did a conceptual analysis of both ethics and human rights law. So these are um, the case studies. Each of those case studies, if you're interested, uh, is written up as a separate document. They're all published, and if you want to look at our website, if you're interested in any of those. Uh, so we looked at IoT, government, agriculture, sustainable. 
the science one possibly of interest to this audience because it uh, used um, the human brain project as a as an example uh, so a, a very medicine oriented um, project uh, we also but we lo looked at across the the, the the spectrum of possible application uh, we looked at insurance utilities communication retail manufacturing and the idea here between those uh, within these case studies was to find out what exactly are the issues that people come around uh, come across when uh, these technologies so ai technologies uh, big data technologies um, when they are implemented in organizations whether those are um, privately owned publicly owned universities um, across a broad range of them so this was about very factual questions so what are current issues uh, in addition we did a set of scenarios of technologies which are already there which are sort of on the cusp of becoming uh, relevant but which we think are likely to become even more relevant in the future so we try to explore what uh, things around uh, predictive uh, policing might look like, how future um, education would look like, uh, autonomous vehicles, deep fakes, uh, the future of warfare. So, so where uh, we see the future going. Um, and the idea was to, to sort of extract from that um, issues that we need to address right now. Now, we realized in the project it's not just us, uh, but it is a much broader question of um, what are the societal perceptions, uh, who are the stakeholders, what are their views, and therefore we um, had a number of activities. We did, uh, we created a stakeholder board, we did an, uh, an online survey, we had a Delphi study, we tried to reach out to various other people uh, to, to uh, um, support our insights. Then on the basis of the identification of what those issues are, we then looked at what are possible ways of dealing with them. And for that we looked at uh, those five specific um, possibilities. So we developed a set of guidelines for research and innovation of science, uh, smart information systems. These were then taken up by the Siena project, which was a sister project of ours by um, people from the University of Twente. Um, and they are now in the process of becoming um, guidance for applicants in Horizon uh, Europe um, applications for the AI world. So you may know that AI is now uh, in Horizon Europe is an ethical issue, according to the, the, the ethical issue list that the European Commission has. And one of the bits of guidance on how to deal with AI from an ethics perspective is uh, based on some of the, the research we've done here. We've also looked at regulatory options. Um, we've looked at standardization uh, potential. Um, we've looked at technical issues, in particular technical options with regard to cybersecurity. And we've written in terms of reference for a potential regulator. Now, we then wanted to try to find out whether any of these things work and how they would work. Um, and that basically boiled down to a set of focus groups where we um, uh, exchanged with stakeholders insights into whether and how any of these proposals might work. And finally, we uh, are also concerned with the question of how can this uh, play out in practice. So we did the normal EU project uh, stuff around dissemination, communication and so on. But we also uh, have an, an artist in residence who, who try to find uh, different ways of expressing the concerns and the ways we interact with these technologies. Um, and we have an advocacy arm in the project, so we have been trying to reach out to, um, in particular, European policymakers, mostly uh, members of the European Parliament, to engage in the debate of um, how um, various intervention measures might be uh, realized. So that's the Sherpa project in a nutshell. And what I'll um, talk about now is really a, an attempt to condense some of the main findings and how they translate into possible ways of uh, addressing these, uh, these questions. Um, so I won't bore you a lot with um, AI definitions. Um, you will all have come across uh, definitions like the, the, the second one here, which is a more academically oriented one. Um, and you will also have seen uh, definitions which typically coming from the policy sector, which are much um, broader and much more encompassing. So if you, the, the, the uh, European Commission white paper definition was AI as a collection of technologies that combine data, algorithms and computing power. Right. Um, we also did look at um, the, the question of how um, AI is used and for what purposes is AI used. And if you look at the, the literature, not so much the academic literature, but certainly the, the policy literature, you'll find that a very strong theme in the discourse is that AI is um, meant to create efficiency, uh, it helps optimize processes, and therefore, in the end, in a um, private company uh, setting, it's there for profit maximization. Uh, it's going to make, make people rich. And that's very strong in, in, in the policy sector, certainly in, in, in this country, in the UK, 
uh, but also across Europe and uh, in other places of the world. It is, however, not the only reason why uh, AI may be used. Uh, another one which is also prominent uh, is that of social control. And the probably most prominent example is the Chinese social credit scoring system. Uh, but you can also find this closer to home. Uh, so if you look at, at Zubov's idea of surveillance capitalism, for example, I think it has a very strong resonance with this idea of using AI to control what people can do, what people should do, what people want to do. And we contrast that with a, a third uh, purpose, which we call human flourishing. And the idea here is that this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a well-established concept from virtual ethics. And the idea behind human flourishing is that it allows people to um, live the life they want to live, uh, that it allows them to reach their potential. Now, these three purposes are not necessarily contradictory. Um, so it may well be that profit maximization is an important condition for human flourishing. Similarly, the pandemic has shown us that on occasion, social control is crucial in order to help people to live a good life, to live a life at all. Right? So, so I'm not saying that they're contradictory, but what I'm saying is that there are different main emphasis behind the use of any technology, including AI. Um, and we are suggesting in the Sherpa project that human flourishing is the one that should be emphasized. Coming back to the concept of AI, AI this is um, from a publication that you see on the left that uh, the publisher Elsevier um, brought out in 2018. And you probably know that Elsevier is one of the biggest publishers in the world. Uh, and among other things, they own the Scopus database. So they have a huge amount of, of access to um, academic literature. And they did a study as a pro bono exercise uh, to find out what people actually talk about when they use the term AI. And um, this is a, on the right here, you see a set of, uh, I think they identified somewhere around 800 keywords uh, from the academic literature on AI, and they tried to cluster those. Um, it was a, a fairly complex uh, methodology they used. And it turns out that there are several main clusters, uh, but there is no unifying concept that brings them all together. And some of the clusters that you can't see on this, this uh, but they are things like natural language processing, machine learning, fuzzy logic. Um, so, so nothing very surprising in there, but I think the interesting um, observation is that there is no shared core that all of AI has in common. And that, of course, is a problem if you want to talk about the ethics of AI. So what we in the Sherpa project therefore then did is we tried to figure out what do people mean when they use AI? So this is not an attempt to define AI, but it is an attempt to describe the usage of the term in practice. And we suggest that there are three different main concepts of AI. One is machine le learning narrow AI in, in the very specific uh, sense. And Bernard Troikov's uh, keynote yesterday, I think, is a very, very beautiful example of, of um, that sort of understanding of AI. Secondly, uh, there are what we call converging socio-technical systems. So this is where you typically have a machine learning core or some other AI technique uh, core, but that's embedded in a broader context, which has social consequences. And then finally, there is uh, general AI or uh, artificial general intelligence or good old fashioned intelligence or whatever you want to call it. These are the sort of technologies that have truly human capabilities. Now, arguably, they don't exist at this point, uh, but they certainly exist in the, in the discourse. This is something that people refer to. Right. So each of these technologies has a set of characteristics, and these characteristics are relevant uh, for an ethical debate. So machine learning. Um, typically is uh, seen as opaque um, because it changes over time, because the internal states of the system change. It's sometimes unpredictable and uh, most current machine learning techniques require big data. And if that data is personal data, of course, it raises all sorts of questions. The converging social technical systems, uh, they are sort of on, on the higher level um, where uh, it's not just about one underlying machine learning technique, but it is about the integration into not just a, a broader set of technologies. So if you think about self-driving cars, um, you have a bit of machine learning somewhere in the middle. Uh, you have a car around it, but you also have a much broader um, social system around it. So you have uh, the whole traffic system. You have uh, part of the legal system that looks after it. So this is a, a, a much broader con uh, concept. And these systems uh, are typically seen as having strong social impact. Uh, they are seen as potentially manipulating people. Um, and the systems are perceived to have autonomy uh, in the sense that they are not necessarily strictly under control of individuals. And then finally, the uh, artificial general intelligence uh, has uh, lots of um, concepts of, of, of relevance with regards to very fundamental issues, such as what is the nature of intelligence? What is human nature? How would we know about reality? So we go from the, the very specific 
um, technology all the way to um, general AI. Now, um, if you follow this uh, categorization of the concept of AI, you'll find that there are specific issues, uh, ethical and, and human rights concerns, which are related to all those three groups. So we have specific issues uh, related to machine learning, general questions about uh, how we live our lives in the, uh, in the digital world, and the final one, which I've called metaphysical questions here. So these are the, the, the bigger philosophical issues. So specific issues are things like bias discrimination, uh, data protection, security. These are very specific um, concerns that arise out of the particular nature of uh, current machine learning. Secondly, we have, uh, in, in terms of these socio-technical systems, we have broader questions around um, how these technologies affect the way we can live our lives. So there are questions around uh, autonomy as an individual, uh, distribution of, of power, distribution of money, uh, how will we fight future wars, uh, who benefits from, from these technologies, who pays for them in the end. And then finally, we have um, very broad concerns uh, um, with regards to, you know, is super intelligence possible? Is human-like intelligence possible? Will there be a singularity event? What does that do to human nature and so on? Now, some of these are open to um, interventions and, and remedies. Um, so explainable AI, I think, is largely a discourse around trying to address particular issues in the top right corner here. Uh, then we have broader questions, um, uh, which I think are mostly in the in the realm of um, policy and politics. So how do we deal with, uh, for example, the, the lack of e equality in distribution of, of, of benefits? Uh, and then you can look at taxation uh, and other types of policies. And then finally, you have these uh, th these big philosophical questions, which are really in the, the realm of philosophy, maybe even theology in some cases. Now, these are, are, are big and fundamental questions. Right, so that was an attempt to capture what is ethics in AI. Uh, what do we do about it? Um, so there are a number of different mitigation measures, uh, that, all of which are currently discussed. Uh, and I, I break them down into four groups. So we have policy and regulatory approaches, we have organizational approaches, we have technical and individual ones. So on the policy and regulatory side, we have uh, on the one hand, various types of regulations that are already relevant to AI, such as uh, competition law, tax law, human rights law, and we also have an in increasing number of suggestions for specific regulation and the recently published um, proposal for regulation by the European Commission, uh, I think is the primary example of that. Then for organizations, we have things like uh, risk management, impact assessment, quality assurance. All of these are processes that are existing already that are in place in many organizations and that can be applied to and used for AI and related technologies. On the technical side, we have um, a lot of uh, research and a lot of proposals on, on what can be done in terms of security, in terms of uh, data protection implementation, uh, in terms of standardization. Um, you know, how, how can you de design these systems um, in a way that is conducive to human flourishing? And finally, we have uh, ways of trying to help individuals who work with these technologies, and that's typically individual researchers or developers or technologists uh, that help uh, that aim to help them deal with ethical concerns in there. And that is uh, things like professionalism. Uh, so the ACM has just refreshed its code of conduct. And uh, there, there are lots of other examples of that. Uh, there are types of methodologies, ethics by design, um, value sensitive design, and various frameworks. The point being here, we have different types of mitigations that uh, go across a number of stakeholder groups. And uh, I, I would uh, distinguish the three, and you can carve this up differently if you will. Uh, I would suggest there are policy stakeholders, there are organizations, and there are individuals involved in this. So on the policy level, you have uh, national governments, you have international organizations such as the EU, OECD, UNESCO, uh, all of which are trying to get into the policy debate around this. You also have um, policy implementing bodies uh, like uh, regulators, uh, data protection authorities, for example, like eth ethics bodies, um, all of which work somewhere in the space of doing something about possible issues on AI. In terms of organizations, you have those organizations who create these things. Uh, so you have the developers, you have um, organizations who make use, deployers, uh, and you also have a number of other bodies that uh, play some role in this. And that may be professional bodies, the media, standards bodies, um, education bodies, and so on. 
And finally, you have a number of uh, different types of, of individuals who play a role here. So from the very astute technical expert uh, to developers, uh, but also I think very importantly, the non-users, the people who are not interested, who don't want anything to do with it, but who are still stakeholders in that they are likely to be affected. Right. So the point of what I've tried to say so far is that uh, this is an immensely complicated mixture. And uh, the, the question then is, how can we um, we deal with this? There is no magic bullet. Uh, this is epistemologically uh, complex. So just understanding what the issues are is very difficult. Uh, there are very complex distributions of responsibility. And at the same time, all of this changes over time because uh, technology moves on and uh, the concerns we have today may not necessarily be the ones we have tomorrow. So what is required is very likely to be some sort of intelligent mix of options, something that brings together various aspects. And uh, we have adopted in the Sherpa project the, the concept of um, uh, ecosystems in order to structure our ways of uh, dealing with this mix of options. Now, the ecosystems metaphor is one that is widely used um, in the AI policy debate. So the, the, the European Union's white paper, for example, uh, talked about the ecosystem of excellence and, and ecosystems of trust. Um, and that's been picked up by, by many other, um, in particular, policy authors. Um, and what we are trying to do is we're trying to think about what such an ecosystems of AI, ecosystem of AI might look like uh, that would be conducive and, and helpful for human flourishing. Um, in order to, to answer that question, uh, an initial uh, concern would be, well, what are the characteristics of ecosystems and how can we make sure that these can be steered in a direction that is desirable? So ecosystems have a number of characteristics that make them um, specific uh, or, or give them a shape that makes it difficult to, to structure interventions. Ecosystems are not normally clearly defined. So the boundaries of what exactly is in and what's out is not necessarily clear and that's got something to do with openness so um, members can join or leave ecosystems uh, that can happen in, in real life ecosystems but also in technical ecosystems uh, there are there's a lot of change and the the concept of evolution is often used as an explanation of why change happens um, and evolution can lead to um, some members of the ecosystems to die out but they can also uh, there can be instances of co-evolution and mutual learning of members of ecosystems. So the uh, actors within it are interdependent um, and they are in complex relationships. All of this means that uh, simple interventions with a, a linear um, trajectory are relatively unlikely to be successful. So in order for then uh, to, to be able to intervene in ecosystems, uh, we've come up with a set of requirements that we think that these interventions would need to fulfill. So on the one hand, uh, an ecosystem intervention needs to be clear in terms of where exactly the boundaries are. So the delimitation of the ecosystem is important. And delimitation can have different aspects to it. So it can be geographical, it can be conceptual. So you know, what type of technology are we talking about? It can be technical. Um, in addition, in, in order for an ecosystem to be able to, to steer its um, direction in a way that is conducive to human flourishing, there has to be a knowledge base that is present in the, uh, in the ecosystem. So there has to be, of course, technical knowledge, there has to be conceptual knowledge. Uh, so what is the AI, who, what is used for, what, what are its, its capabilities, but also uh, procedural ones uh, such as how do I understand what stakeholders uh, requirements are, uh, how, uh, uh, how can I have public discourses in order to understand what the, uh, possible problems are. And importantly, there needs to be a capacity building component. So this knowledge base needs to not only exist, but it needs to be maintained, it needs to be developed, um, and the ecosystem needs to be able to uh, sustain it. And then finally, uh, there are questions of governance. So an ecosystem can have governance uh, mechanisms. And in order um, for those to be relevant and successful, they have to be uh, flexible. They have to be adaptive. There has to be an ability to learn. And there has to be what we call meta responsibility. So the idea uh, that existing governance structures need to be overseen by a, a higher level uh, view of the system as a whole. So these are the the three main requirements, and we try to translate those then into uh, a set of recommendations. These recommendations are meant to support AI ecosystems to promote human flourishing. And the idea is that in the end of this, there would be ethics seen as an integral part of excellence in AI. So that there's not good AI here and there's ethics there, but it's actually, you know, in order to be excellent AI and arguably any other technology has to consider ethics um, at the outset. 
So that's the, the vision. Um, and then the question is, how could that be realized? How could we put that in practice? Um, and we've come up with a set of recommendations um, which mirror the three requirements that I've just talked about a minute ago. So these three requirements were the delimitation of the ecosystem, uh, the knowledge base, and the governance. And in terms of delimitation, uh, we, we are arguing that there has to be conceptual clarity within the ecosystem in order to ensure that interventions are possible. In terms of governance, uh, we're suggesting that there should be a regulatory framework, and we give a lot more detail on what that should cover. Um, we're suggesting that there should be some sort of focal point, and we call this an EU agency for AI because we're in a European project um, and agencies exist on the European level. But the idea really is to have a, a center of, of, uh, of excellence, a gatekeeper, uh, where key um, conceptual aspects and, and key regulatory principles are uh, housed. And then finally, we're suggesting that uh, governance would be helped by having a role on an organizational level. We've called this an AI ethics officer. So this would be somebody sitting in a company, uh, sitting in a public authority, who would have the, the role of um, bridging the ethical and the technical side um, of, uh, of the system in, 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 uh, in question. And then finally, in terms of what knowledge has to exist in such an ecosystem, uh, we're suggesting that there should be an AI impact assessment baseline. So there should be an agreement of how you can structure um, the thinking about possible impacts of AI. Uh, we're suggesting that there, there should be um, a methodology. This is the ethics by design that I mentioned earlier, which is now uh, likely to be adopted by the European Commission. Um, we think that there has to be training and education in, uh, across all different levels. Um, we believe standardization will play a key role. Um, and we also think that there are specific issues uh, around security that need to be covered here. Now, each of these uh, recommendations, uh, you can look up our website, at our website and, and we've uh, provided a lot more detail on them. Uh, but what I think is important is to see them as a, as a system of recommendations. So it's not just one, but these things hang together. Uh, so they hang together on sort of the, the, the bigger level. So the limitation, for example, needs to be clear in order to define the knowledge base. Similarly, the knowledge base may well be required um, in order to de delineate exactly what it is uh, that the ecosystem covers. The governance structures will incentivize uh, knowledge uh, development or creating of, of knowledge bases. Similarly, the, the knowledge base will inform what the governance structures are. And the governance needs to think about where exactly the, the limitations are. So there are sort of relationships between these, these different groups, but there are also relationships among these recommendations. So a regulatory framework, for example, would mandate an agency for AI. They, it might mandate uh, an AI ethics officer. Um, same is true on the knowledge base, where you know, an ethics by design approach might include an ethics uh, AI impact assessment. It, might, it would require training. Uh, it would draw on security insights and so on. And the relationships are not just within those bigger bubbles, but they're also across those bubbles. So the individual recommendations um, are relevant to each other. So if we had such a thing as an ethics officer, there would probably have to be a curriculum to train that role. Uh, a regulatory framework might uh, include an AI impact assessment and so on. So the point is that these things should be seen as a, a, a whole, not just a, a, a pick and mix approach. So this is a different picture covering the exact same topic. Um, so this is what we have on our website. This is our, our infographic of our main uh, recommendations. Um, and with that, I, I'm coming to, uh, to the conclusion here. Uh, so if you're interested, if you think any of this makes sense, if you want to follow it up, um, there is a book which is just published. This is open access, so you can download it for free and read it on your, uh, on your Kindle or whatever. Uh, where I've tried to uh, develop these thoughts in a lot more detail and um, provide the, 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 the logic um, in a way, in, in an academically rigorous and hopefully interesting way. And I think with that, I'll stop sharing and hopefully I'll see somebody else again. Thank you. And maybe Key C is taking over. Yeah, thanks for the great talk, Mark. And uh, I see some there are some questions from the chat, and I will pick them from the very beginning for discussion. And uh, I think the first um, question will be from uh, Linda. So the question is asking what happens if all of the border between of these AI concepts gets blurred? 
example, a narrow AI with large algorithms also has a sector impact, of course, and uh, it gets the naive answer that it gets even more complicated. So would you like to give some uh, insights on these discussions? Thank you. Yeah, that, that is a, a, a um, non-trivial question. Uh, I mean, I think I should uh, start by re repeating that this was not an attempt to, to uh, give a um, scientifically rigorous uh, definition of AI, but rather an attempt to capture what are the streams of debate that we can observe. So we can uh, observe people talking about very narrow AI. We can talk about we can observe people talking about uh, socio-technical system. But in practice, of course, you're right. right? There, there, there is no hard border. So this is. Uh, just machine learning, and we don't need to worry about uh, the, the, the socio-technical side, uh, and and so on. And and of course, there is the question of whether machine learning is something that might actually lead to artificial general, general intelligence, and how that would work. So these things are not entirely uh, disparate. I still think, though, that this distinction is useful and relevant, in that it allows you to think about the intervention strategies and the level of um, uh, and, and the type of stakeholders involved in addressing them. So I think. Uh, if, if you take a very narrow technical view of machine learning, then there are certain things that you can probably deal with on the on the local level, um, which don't need to escalate up all the way to, uh, to, to the political level. Other things, however, uh, so for example, the imbalance of, of um, cost and benefit, now the fact that the big internet companies make billions and billions and the rest of us don't get anything for it, uh, I think that's not something that a machine learning technician can possibly deal with. This is really a, a problem on a different level. Well, that's where the politics needs to intervene. Um, and, and therefore, I think that distinction, distinction still makes sense, but I fully grant you that you know, it, it's not comprehensive, it's not exclusive, it's not the only way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, great. I agree. So uh, maybe I have a follow up with this. So uh, if the concept of the broad, of, of broader uh, are sort of blurred and they, they may have similar scenes, but I'm wondering uh, would the uh, the border of the ethnics for AI will get blurred between one concept to another? Um, well, I, I mean, I, while I, I've talked about ethics a lot, I haven't really said much about uh, the, the philosophical ethics and the conceptual basis um, of why we would consider something uh, ethical or non-ethical. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, there, there is a whole discourse around that. Um, now, why, why do we think, for example, discrimination is an ethical problem? Um, why, why do we think that uh, justice and distribution is, is an ethical problem? Um, so I, I do think, um, so, so I'm, I'm not saying that there is a, a type of ethics for machine learning and a different type of ethics for um, broader socio-technical systems. So, so I think the, uh, the philosophical ethical underpinning of this um, will probably be um, covering all the different aspects. So, so the blurring of the boundaries between the different types of concepts does not necessarily create a problem from an ethical perspective in that you know, all of a sudden ethics here uh, in part A is no longer applicable in part B. I think there, there are much bigger questions, and much bigger questions around what counts as an ethical issue, why does it count as an ethical issue, and how, does, how do things like ethical theory, like philosophical ethical theory, deontology, utilitarianism, you name them, how they influence our evaluation of these co concerns. Yeah, great. Thank you. So maybe we can move on to the next question. So the next question is, I think it's very interesting. It's about the timeline about uh, ethnic AI. So uh, Janda is asking, do you think safety of general AI that may potentially be soon developed is an urgent problem to address in this century? So how, how do you comment on this timeline? Yes, it's uh, another difficult question. They're all difficult, otherwise you wouldn't ask them. Right? <laughs> Um, so, so my personal view is uh, I'm not particularly worried about it. Uh, so I, I don't mm -hmm. think we're seeing anything at the moment uh, where AI is actually at the point where it uh, becomes truly intelligent, whatever that might mean. I'm not, not even going to try to go there. Uh, at this point, AI still tends to be fairly stupid. And, and I think um, uh, Bernard's uh, keynote yesterday was a good example of that. And that's a, the, the, the simple uh, mistakes AI still makes, or um, I mean, at this point, AI has absolutely no concept of uh, a context, right? And and I think unless it gets that at some point, uh, we we don't really need to worry about it being truly intelligent in whichever form. Mm -hmm. um, I I cannot of course I cannot rule it out that it's going to happen. Uh, I I would be surprised if it were to happen with the technologies we currently have at our disposal, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I can't prove that either. 
uh, I think the, the more interesting question, rather than saying, well, there is this AI, this general AI thing, and, and there is where we are at the moment, I think it's more to think about what is the trajectory? And, and uh, the ecosystem's perspective, I think, is helpful here in that we understand it's never just a technology. It's not the Terminator that's going to come from the future and it's going to wipe us all out. It is always going to be a technology within a socio-technical system. It's going to be part of what humans do, what uh, institutions do, what regulations do. And I think the interesting question really is what capabilities do technologies currently have and what can we realistically expect them to have and how will that play out in a foreseeable future? I think from, from my perspective, that's the interesting question rather than the question, will it ever be truly intelligent? Which now Turing said, it's a stupid question, I can't answer it. And no, wh who am I to argue with him? Yeah, I see. Yes, I fully agree. So uh, the timeline is important and also the pathway, the trajectory is also important as well. So let's move on. The next one is uh, interesting, also challenging on global scale. Uh, it seems that any country introducing the strong regulations of uh, AI research would put itself at a strong disadvantage. Then uh, how can such regulations be enforced or encouraged on a global scale? Yes. I that uh, is the question that the European Commission, of course, is um, grappling with at the moment. I mean, the, the European Union has taken the, the step of proposing the AI regulation, and we'll see how, how the feedback on that goes and whether it will ever be enacted or not. Uh, but certainly the European Commission has taken the position of saying, um, we in Europe have a set of uh, fundamental shared values, and, and mostly those are that, that, that are uh, implemented through human rights regulation, um, and we insist that AI um, takes those seriously and, and respects those principles. Uh, and we will put in place a fairly heavy regulatory mechanism in order to ensure that that happens. Uh, and the concern that I've heard many occasions uh, from people working in the European Commission and people working in, in, in the European Union more broadly uh, is exactly the concern that you voice here. Does that mean that we actually price ourselves out of the market? Does that mean that the Americans, the Chinese, whoever else you know, pulls ahead because they are not encumbered by any uh, regulation and therefore the Europeans will be at a disadvantage? Um, to which I, I would say, well, that to a large extent, that is actually an empirical question because you, you can see two, two trajectories here. One is sort of the, the pessimistic one. Uh, Europe loses out because they overregulate. Everybody else uh, gets to innovate and, and we fall behind. Now that's the, the, the dystopia. The other side, of course, is that uh, by regulating, by putting measures in place to ensure that these technologies do what citizens want, uh, the European technologies are more likely to get by and people are more likely to, to want to engage with them. Uh, and therefore, they will also be more successful in the market. Now that's the mm -hmm. utopia. So you have the, the, those two possible trajectories. And of course, you have lots of trajectories somewhere in the middle. Um, I think to, to a large extent, it will be an empirical question. Now, do we get this regulation right? I wouldn't say regulation is necessarily good or bad. I think it, it has a lot to do with the specifics of the regulation. Does it achieve what it's supposed to achieve? And if, if so, then I think there is a good chance of, of a race to the top. You know, that um, the, the Americans will emulate and say, look, the Americans are doing something, uh, the, the Europeans are doing something which the European citizens like. Shouldn't we do the same? Um, I think that is possible if we get it right in, in terms of the setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this question is very interesting. I have a follow up. Uh, do you think the, uh, so what's your opinion about the regulation in your international level? So will uh, different places share the same regulations for ethnics or different places can have different adaptations uh, with relevance to their local culture? Yeah, well, I think um, it's, it's probably fairly uncontroversial to say that this has to be localized, right? So, so there has to be, be, be local um, sensitivity. Even if all of humanity were to agree on ethical principles, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon, uh, even then people would want to make sure that they are heard in their local context. So I've, I've been in a, uh, in a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago, which was hosted in India, where that point was very strongly made and said, well, we have you now our Indian context and therefore in India, AI ethics probably looks different. Now we have different views on what, what's good and bad. Um, and I think then that you come into an interesting question around the universality of ethics. I think there probably are some universals in here. So there are probably some things where we could say this is likely to be relevant to everybody. But how that is uh, implemented, how that plays out in practice may look very different from place to place. So, so um, I, I do think that there will be local variation, uh, but there will also, I think, uh, if this is to be successful, there has to, has to be a, a global baseline where we say, well, no, nobody should fall below that. What exactly that's going to look like? Well, that's, I don't know. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Very true. So, uh, you mentioned about implementation. So here is also a question about implementation. So, uh, Linda is asking, how optimistic are you? Uh, are you currently regarding the ethical implementation of AI in the future, especially in light of all of your recent work with the project Shepra? Any comments on this? Yeah. Uh, so I think I'm I'm very optimistic that um, some things will be will be done, will be addressed. Uh, so I think we can observe that there is a, a very strong consensus around a particular set of issues. So so um, discrimination, um, data protection. These are things where everybody knows uh, AI and related technologies may have an impact. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, concern about this happening. So you lose your, your credit scoring, you go to prison because of your environment and so on. And so there's a lot of consensus that this is to be avoided. And there's a lot of uh, regulatory and um, generally normative activities in order to avoid that. So, so I'm very optimistic that that will be put in place and that these issues, um, they won't disappear. I'm not saying discrimination is going to go away, but I, I do think that um, it, it will become easier to do something about it. It will be easier to recognize it because it's a well-established problem. I'm a lot less optimistic about sort of the, the medium uh, level issues. So, so questions of justice, international distribution, or the, the big American companies get make trillions at this point. Uh, the rest of the world doesn't make a lot. Now, I think changing that is going to be much more, more difficult. Um, and then, of course, there are sort of the, the, these big philosophical questions around uh, superintelligence, which I'm not sure that they're even open to to answers. I'm, I'm not sure that they, it is possible to to say, well, this would be a solution. Mm -hmm. So, as Alex is here, uh, Alex, uh, would you like to take the rest of the question? I, yeah, well, I would have one one question myself right now, uh, as we are going from uh, a more uh, local context to a more global context maybe um, and that question would be if we look at medical devices a lot of times uh, we, we look at a purpose and then we look at the risk of a certain procedure uh, balanced uh, against what, what good can be done. Um, when we look at AI as you introduced it it seems to be uh, dichotomic right we have just uh, the AI doing something or you're not AI. Do we need something in between? Do we need a purpose? For instance, when we look at the uh, machine learning, as we look, as we study it here, um, which may not be intended as general AI at all. Yes, so, um, I mean, part of the point of this ecosystem idea was, of course, to say that it's, it's not just the AI doing something. It's always the AI doing something in a context, uh, in, in a system of systems, other technical systems, but also other social, social systems. So it's, it's never just a technology that's on its own. Um, and I think that, to me, really is crucial uh, in understanding why we think about some things as being more ethically relevant than others. I think in the, the medical field is, uh, is interesting, uh, partly because we generally accept that medical research is a good thing. We all want to be healthy, and therefore we don't normally question whether doing research that can promote health is a good thing. And that is true for medical research in general, but also medical research re uh, regarding technology. Now, I think, though, that is possibly problematic. You know, that, um, if, if you compare medical AI research with, for example, military AI research, you know, where you would have to make a completely different type of argument, uh, why something might be justified, even though you may be looking at this, the same technology uh, in, in different contexts. And I think that's where it gets really difficult. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of the, it's the, the, the spillover, the misuse, the, the dual use, uh, but it's also the thinking about what possible consequences might be, you know, which we can never fully assess, uh, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about um, at least to the degree that we can. And in, in medical research, for example, uh, I, th I think it would be worth asking the question more often, you know, what are not just the intended consequences, but what are likely and foreseeable unintended consequences and how do we consider those in the research? So Did that answer your question? A very good point uh, for, for or a, a very good um, argument uh, that was also made here in the chat. Um, have you looked at uh, applications of AI in or implications of AI used in warfare and uh, uh, is the, the regulation, the ethical implications of AI, are those comparable maybe to <laughs> nuclear weapons? Yes, so so we we have looked at that. I mean, there, there's of course a whole huge discourse around that. Uh, so there's the the legal autonomous uh, weapon systems discourse, 
Um, and th there are very strong and also quite advanced uh, attempts to regulate this, um, not so much like uh, along the lines of nuclear weapons, uh, but more along the lines of, um, of landmines. Right? So we have international treaties that outlaw landmines. Landmines are generally seen as um, weapons of war that um, countries shouldn't use. And there, there is a very strong push to include um, autonomous weapons in that, which which I fully agree with. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of the military also likes it because the military uh, would be unemployed if we had autonomous weapons. Uh, I think it does raise interesting questions though around uh, when does a, a weapon system become autonomous and, and what, are, what, what exactly is the scope? And that comes back to this delimitation question. Now, what is the scope of AI we're looking at? Now, do, if we have, for example, an AI doing a battlefield observation, is that already something that would fall under such a regulation? Or is it just a, you know, a, a little autonomous tank that blows people up? Um, so, so there's, again, there's this huge scope of possible uses of technologies, and it's very difficult to say what exactly falls under an ethically problematic category and, and where we would say that's fine. Well, I have to admit I was never worried about military getting unemployed. But uh, apart from that, uh, Bernd, thank you very much for an inspiring keynote here. We have way more questions than we can take, unfortunately. Um, but uh, thank you very much again. And uh, thanks to all our uh, audience and uh, to Chi for co-hosting this or co-chairing this session. I'm handing over to uh, Matthias, who is leading or leading you to the next session, I suppose. Thank you very much.